Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me start by thanking you all for coming out, some from Johannesburg, others from Pretoria, but wherever, uh, braving the traffic this early in the morning to get here at 9 o'clock. Um, thank you for that. Um, the topic that we're going to be discussing this morning, um, or this half of the day, um, I think is, is one that is uh, very interesting, extremely interesting, um, and important and significant for all of us sitting in this room, whether we South Africans or diplomats from various other countries, um, whichever countries those are, um, an extremely important uh, um, topic because it has been pitched as being something that will, in a sense, be a historical event. Um, the what has been dubbed the Iran nuclear deal um, as being an event that will change the signing of, of, of the deal, that will change history in a sense, uh, at least for this part of the century. Um, whether that's true or not is what we want to explore today. What significance it has for, um, for the rest of the world is what we want to discuss. And particularly for us, what significance it might have for South Africa is what we would like uh, to come out of this discussion. Uh, not necessarily from the panel, but, but from, from the discussion. Um, this is, looking around the room, there are few people that are older than me in, in, this, uh, in this room, not too many. So for those that are around my age and, and older than me, um, you will know that there was a time when relations between Iran and the United States were actually, oh, there they were actually relations between Iran and the United States. That this kind of situation where the two didn't talk to each other um, is only about 35 years old. Um, and what we're seeing now is an issue on which both these countries are agreeing, but not only both these countries, many other countries as well. And through their allies are pulling most of the rest of the world into line, uh, into supporting um, this, uh, this agreement and what will come out of the agreement. Many of us believe that it's a good thing. Um, it'll have uh, positive implications for the world, but not all of us do. Some of us think that, uh, that it can be a problem for various other players. Um, among, among those who think it's a problem, of course, we could include the Israelis, the Saudis, for example. Uh, but also other uh, saner voices who would like to problematize the whole thing. And that's what we would like to do today, is to discuss what this, uh, what this deal means um, and to see what its implications are for the region, uh, the Middle East, North Africa region, uh, for the rest of the world, and as, as I said, particularly for South Africa. We will conduct the, the seminar in two, two sessions. The first session is the one we'll have now, uh, first panel, and then the second one uh, thereafter. In the first session, we have uh, two speakers. Uh, as with the second, we have two speakers. Then the two speakers we have in the first session are uh, Dr. Zainab Qasimi Tari. Uh, Zainab is a uh, um, qualified in American, got a PhD in American studies from the University of Tehran. Her focus has been on Iran-U.S. relations after the 1979 Islamic Revolution, or as I suggested to her, perhaps it should be uh, changed to say Iran-U.S. non-relations after the revolution. Um, she teaches uh, at the University of Tehran Orientalism and Colonial and Post-Colonial Studies. So we're very pleased to have uh, uh, Zainab with us, particularly pleased because she filled in at the last moment as uh, Many of you might, might have realized, uh, of course for some of us, uh, Persian names all sound the same, but uh, as many of you might have realized, the first invitation we sent out um, had another, another name, Iranian uh, academic that would be speaking, but unfortunately uh, he had a family issue and couldn't make it, and Zainab agreed uh, three or four days ago to, uh, to fill in for him. So we're very pleased for that and also very pleased Where's the South African Dirko people here? Very pleased that, uh, that the South African Embassy in Tehran um, speeded up the process. Uh, thank you, Zainab, for being here. And the second speaker in this panel will be uh, Brooks Spector. Brooks, I think, is known to many of us. Um, when, we, when we want to disagree with him, we say he's American, of course. Um, otherwise, we can ignore that fact and speak about uh, what he does now. Brooks is kind of South African since he's married to, to a South African. 
Um, he's currently the associate editor of uh, the Daily Maverick, uh, the online publication. Uh, he's also had a very interesting work history. He was uh, he ran the Market Theater for a while, um, worked for another international NGO, but. I suppose the main reason we have him here is not because of the Market Theatre, Daily Maverick, and, and his international NGO, but because um, he's a former American diplomat that was stationed in South Africa. Um, we hope that more former, uh, more diplomats in South Africa would fall in love and live here, but well, maybe not. Diplomats are not always the best people to have around. But uh, welcome, Brooks. It's good to have you around, uh, with all my disclaimers. Um, so you'll notice that the two speakers that we have in the first session, Iranian and, and American, and they're going to speak about uh, their particular perspectives on the deal, uh, explain to us what it means, and, um, and, and what they think the implications might be and, and why it might be good or not good uh, for the rest of us. The second, second panel um, will be introduced by Matlatsi, who will chair that, but let me just say, the second panel will include uh, Ibrahim Dean from the Afro Middle East Center and uh, Malak uh, Shabkun from uh, the Al Jazeera Center for Studies. And they will look more particularly at the implications of the deal for the Middle East North Africa region. Uh, but more about that later. So let me begin by inviting Zainab to the podium. So I would like to thank the committee members of the for their kind invitation to the seminar, as the topic is very important for Iranians. But I think the debate could be more comprehensive if more Iranians were invited to uh, the uh, one day seminar. First of all, I would like to stress upon this important issue that for, from an Iranian perspective, the whole issue on Iran's nuclear standoff was an unnecessary crisis. And this is not just the Islamic Republic claims, but what the Western intelligence reports were saying since 2003, in 2007, and in 2012. And so, for example, in 2012, there was a consensus of 16 US intelligence agencies that indicated that Iran has not sought to build a nuclear weapon. In the same year that um, Benjamin Netanyahu was trying to persuade world leaders in the United Nations that Iran is just one year away from bomb, and he is saying that for 20 years, there was Mossad actually report which was saying that Iran was not performing the activity necessary to produce weapons and that Iran is not an existential threat to Israel. And as you know, IAEA, uh, in, uh, IAEA actually is conducting, if, even before the deal, the most intrusive inspections on Iran. And the, the IAEA inspectors could never find any solid evidence that Iran's nuclear program had diverged from a peaceful program. Uh, this is actually, I will have a very short snapshot to history that during Iran-Iraq war when many thousands of Iranian soldiers and civilians were, being, were killed by chemical weapons that was actually provided by world powers to Saddam Hussein, Iranians refused to retaliate in kind though they had the capability to build chemical and biological weapons at that time because they considered it as, as a sort of violation of Islamic principles and forbidden based on Islamic jurisprudence. Having said that, I think uh, about the Iran uh, nuclear deal, there are some controversies. Um, inside the country, some people look at it very positively. They think that the relation, everything is going to change after the deal. There are others who actually look at this deal from a very negative perspective. They think Iran had shown too much flexibility and concession to make the deal. But there are others who think, well, OK, it was a deal. And then in, there are some loopholes in the deal. But this is a deal. And the have to give some things and get something in return. Um, but, so I would acknowledge the fact that a few points were very significant for Iran in this deal. The first one was that Iran's uh, actually file was desecuritized. And this is very important because the most brutal and crippling sanctions on Iran were uh, because of securitization of the nuclear deal. And I would like to say that these sanctions put pressure on ordinary Iranians, a huge pressure. There was a time that we could not get medicine we need for cancer patients because of the sanctions. 
So this is very important for Iranians. At the same time, Iran's right for enriching uranium is recognized by world powers, which is a sort of, you know, this program, the Iranians, were, there were polls inside the country that Iranians were very supportive of a deal before the deal. But at the same time, Iranians were saying that uh, based on the polls, majority of Iranians were favoring a deal that would recognize Iran's right to nuclear uh, peaceful energy. Iran also will continue its research and development work, and Iran uh, expects that no new EU uh, and UN sanctions, related sanctions to, uh, uh, to uh, I mean, nuclear-related sanctions would be imposed upon Iran, and Iran actually expects that the U.S. will cease application of its nuclear-related sanctions. Um, but why actually this deal was made at this moment, uh, from an Iranian perspective, um, there were a number of factors leading, which led to a comprehensive nuclear deal. The first and the most important one was the U.S. desire for rapprochement with Iran. As you know, the, this was a decade, actually uh, over a decade, a standoff. And uh, for the first time, Iranians negotiated with Americans directly. This is important because Iranians actually considered something has changed. And from an Iranian perspective, this was uh, actually the number of, a number of factors was the most important among them was a dire situation in the Middle East, in Syria, the situation in Syria and Iraq. And at the same time, that it can, there was an economic crisis in Europe, and also, so this actually made it difficult for um, for United States to keep uh, consensus uh, on sanction re regimes on Iran. Rise, rise of China and Ukraine is also considered by some people as an important issue, and as an important factor leading to the comprehensive nuclear deal. Uh, it has implications for Iran. Um, from an Iranian perspective, many Iranians actually think that it's going to incorporate Iran into a global economy, and potentially it, it will mean that Iran will see an economic boom and greater foreign investment. Um, and if the sanctions are lifted, it can, Iran will improve its economic ties with non-Western non -Western countries like China, Russia, and also emerging economies like BRICS. Uh, Iran also will work on a way to minimize its vulnerability to future sanctions based on experiences it had gained during the last decade. But from um, this is also an important. Uh, many many are uh, arguing that Iran-U.S. relation is going to change after the deal. Um, but it seems that from an, I mean, someone coming from Iran, I think it does not end the animosity between Iran and the U.S. Because actually there is a history and also there is current uh, policies of the United States that actually creates a clash between Iran and the United States. The history actually, I will not go to details, but there was this 1953 coup when actually uh, Americans um, overthrew a democratically elected government, uh, government of Mossadegh in Iran, then Iranians will actually um, mention uh, American support for Iraq during Iran-Iraq war, providing Saddam with uh, financial, military, and intelligence support during eight years of war, uh, uh, shutting down an Iranian civilian airliner, killing two, uh, 270 people. From an uh, American perspective, you will hear hostage crisis in 1979. There is a history, and also it seems that the rapprochement is unlikely because of the current situation, uh, current policies of the United States in the Middle East. So after the deal, Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei issued, this, I mean, he, he actually made a speech and he was saying that we have repeatedly said we don't negotiate with the U.S. on regional or international affairs, not even on bilateral, bilateral issues. There are, some, there are some exceptions like the nuclear program that we negotiated with the Americans to serve our interest. But it seems that for the Iranians, actually, the United States is pursuing some contradictory goals in the Middle East. On one hand, they have to per actually persuade, um, uh, sell the actually Iranian deal at home, persuade the Congress that actually to keep the deal. And at the same time, they have to keep their resentful regional allies happy abroad. Uh, there are also seems that there, is, there are serious disagreements over issue of Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And concept, I mean, uh, different interpretations of uh, uh, groups uh, like Hezbollah, Hamas, and Islamic Jihad, which Iran actually considers them as resistance groups, groups while the Americans and Israelis and also Saudis consider them as uh, ter terrorist groups. Regional conflicts in Syria, Yemen, and Iraq are also very important. There are very um, 
the clash of strategic visions between the two countries over uh, these three, con I mean, uh, Syria, Yemen, and Iraq. So uh, there is also this um, uh, argument that there is a prospect for Iran-US partnership over ISIS, which seems to many very, uh, very this prospect is, not, is a bleak one, because from an Iranian perspective, how can the US be a serious partner in fighting a terrorist movement while it has played a critical role in creating that, that actually uh, movement, this uh, extremism in the region? So back then, a year ago, U.S. Vice President was saying that uh, it, it, their original allies were fueling terrorism in Syria. He is telling half-truth. This is his quote. Uh, this is a quotation from Joe Biden. Our allies in the region were our largest problem in Syria: the Turks, the Saudis, the Emirates. They were so determined to take down Assad and essentially have a proxy Sunni Shia war. What did they do? They poured hundreds of millions of dollars and tens thousands of tons of weapons into anyone who could who would fight against Assad. But then, actually, recently there are um, there are um, some declassified. Um, reports coming from uh, defense intelligence, um, DIA defense intelligence report in 2015 on June, U.S. intelligence report predict is, is saying that, that in 2012, the Americans actually predicted and welcomed the prospect of a Salafi principality in eastern Syria and Al-Qaeda controlled Islamic State in Syria and Iraq in order to isolate their Syrian regime, which is considered the strategic depth of Shia expansion in Iraq and Iran. And also, there was this uh, recent uh, interview in Al Jazeera by the former U.S. Defense Intelligence Chief General Michael Flynn, which was saying that the rise of Islamic State was a willful decision made in Washington. So this actually uh, creates a sort of pessimism over the few, if Iran will. Uh, collaborate with the U.S. Uh, fighting against ISIS, though Iran is playing a major role in Iraq right now and also Syria. Uh, from original, uh, for actually original implication, I mean mostly original, I mean uh, Middle East, I'm not um, actually, I don't, I'm not informed about Africa, North Africa. Uh, uh, it, it can be perceived from both positively and negatively. It can actually have both positive and negative implications. There, there is prospect of an expansion of trade between Iran and Arab Gulf countries, especially United Arab Emirates and Oman. And you will see, you see that Minister Zarif started his tour of Kuwait, Qatar, and Iraq after making the deal to show that they are willing for, to improve their relations with, uh, with their immediate neighbors. But there is also this fear of Saudi Arabia and some other regional countries that the engagement of Iran with the U.S. is going to harm their interest in the region and will make Iran more powerful than before. Uh, I will say that Iran will continue its support for Iraq, Syria, and Yemen, which is uh, the, the controversial point. Uh, Iran, uh, support, Iran actually thinks that their support is bo both moral and strategic. In Syria, Iran will support Syrian peace plan based on four-point initiative, which includes an Im immediate ceasefire, found formation of a national unity government, constitutional protection for minorities, and supervised election. This is why apparently the U.S. and some of its, its regional allies in the region, uh, th their top priority policy is uh, toppling Assad. In Iraq, Tehran's aim is to destroy ISIS while preserving territorial integrity of the na and national unity of Iraq. Iran favors a strong central government while the U.S. supports dividing Iraq into Sunni, Shia, and Kurdish lines. And Iran actually is present in Iraq, we know that, but it was at the request of the legitimate government of Iran. And Ir Iran is actually supporting both Shia and Kurdish, which are Sunni, and this is not a sectarian war based on Iranian, from an Iranian perspective. In Yemen, Iran does not consider the unrest in Yemen as a Sunni-Shia proxy war between Saudi and Iran-backed Houthis. And Iran favors an accord between all sides in Yemen, which would imply for, uh, which would imply for all sides to share power. Uh, concluding, actually, uh, what I'm saying, I mean, the short speech is that I think given that Iran has demonstrated its power in helping secure its own borders, Iran is the most um, stable country in the region right now, and actually it has shown capability of fighting ISIS, in, especially in Iraq. Um, there seems, it seems that the United States needs Iran for partnering on original objectives, but if actually it, 
this is going to be, I mean, the, this clash of interests in the region will pose, a, I think, a serious um, concern over future uh, or prospects for um, relation between Iran and the U.S. Thank you so much. Good morning. Um, can you all hear? Great. Um, I thank you for this opportunity. Uh, let, me, let me start, actually just to underscore something which should go without saying, but always needs to be said. Um, I, I need to make it absolutely clear that I don't speak on behalf of the U.S. government in any way, shape, or form. I haven't taken a U.S. government paycheck for over a decade. Um, and I certainly don't think they expect me to speak on their behalf. They'd probably be horrified if they thought I was. Um, especially given some of the things I have written and some of the things I've said and some of the disagreements that I've had. But nevertheless, uh, I'm here speaking from my own perspective as an analyst. Um, a second qualification, of course, is that I'm not an Iranian or Middle Eastern specialist. Um, I spent a little time in the Middle East, uh, but just for a few weeks, uh, so that clearly made me an expert. It, it didn't really, but it, it gave me yet another set of perspectives. And sometime in another circumstance, maybe we'll talk about that trip. Um, but one of my closest friends in the foreign the American Foreign Service, was a specialist uh, on U.S.-Iranian relations and had worked there in the 1970s, fell in love with the country, uh, fell in love with an Iranian woman and got married. Um, and made a point of telling me, uh, as he um, explained his sadness about the way things had worked out in the 1980s, uh, his reaction was that the, uh, the nation of Iran was, was trying to find its place in the 20th century, now obviously we're, we're at the 21st, and that the preeminent struggle for the country would be something along the lines of its gaining, or perhaps, and this is how he would have said it, regaining its national pride and impact on the world. And I think that's one lens to look at this question through. Um, a second point is, uh, and I don't think we need to belabor it, uh, is the, the range of US-Iranian uh, relations they have rarely been uh, calm and unruffled. And this begins probably uh, at the time of uh, the then uh, President Mossadegh and then on through the, the rule of the Shah and then into the 1979 revolution, the, ta the taking of American embassy personnel as hostage and the agony, at least on behalf and for and within the United States on that issue that only ended uh, a minute or so after noon of J January 20th, 1981, when they were finally released. Thereafter, the relationship, in quotes, uh, at least at the official level, has largely been the absence of a relationship uh, and the frequent exchange of some fairly fierce and sometimes very angry words but no diplomats, virtually no trade, and certainly no relationship on the broader agenda of international affairs. But in the, in the near term present, it seems to me that several things came together to bring the, what was called the P5 plus one, the US, Britain, France, so Russia, China, Germany, and Iran, into a better place or a better space sufficient to encourage some sort of rapprochement, even if it was on a very limited and certainly circumscribed area. Sorry, the, uh, the house uh, email internet access keeps trying to tell me I haven't, I haven't logged in properly. I haven't tried to log in yet, but nevertheless. Um, I think those, all of this um, 
underscores uh, a, a, a phrase that is sometimes attributed to Henry Kissinger, uh, who said, you negotiate with your antagonists, not with your friends. If they were your friends, you would already have reached agreement. And in this case, I think it was, it, it very clearly illuminates what happened. Um, from my perspective, at least, there were five major areas of change that led to this agreement. The first was the very real need uh, within Iran to gain access to its significant foreign frozen financial assets, uh, large amount of money, more than I make. The second were some very real demands that have been percolating upward within Iranian society for some years now for more access to foreign goods, services, products, ideas, and a general larger access to the world. The third was the ability of Iran to market its petroleum more easily and legally on the international open market to generate revenue. The fourth was the growing need on the part of many nations to confront, whether we call it IS or ISIS or ISIL. Um, Daesh is a better name. Sorry? Daesh is a better name. Okay. <laughs> Them. <laughs> to confront that group. Um, where there clearly is a range of shared interests um, among countries that might otherwise have had serious antagonisms among them. And the fifth was a broad recognition, apparently, that the addition of a new nuclear power in the region would increase the region's instability rather than increase stability. Now, in terms of the actual agreement, this P5 plus 1 Iran agreement, and I keep saying P5 plus 1 rather than U.S.-Iran agreement for a very simple reason. It isn't a bilateral agreement, and it, it very largely is the product of six nations coming together to reach this agreement. And I think it's, it sometimes is unrealistically characterized as a bilateral discussion, and I think that, that needs to be stressed. Um, it's in very broad strokes, although I'm sure most everybody in this room has a reasonably good idea of what it contains, uh, the key elements were, were a series of reciprocal arrangements on the rollback of economic sanctions and the unfreezing of heretofore freezing asset, frozen assets in return for a halt in the production of nuclear weapons grade fissile materials. That notice I didn't use the word, the creation, the phrase, the creation of an atomic weapon. Nuclear weapons grade fissile materials and an unparalleled agreement on international inspections of publicly declared facilities as well as secret ones um, and some significant compromises on the way these inspections would be announced and then therefore carried out. And as a result of the signing of the agreement just a while ago, um, in the United States, the focus shifts to, I think, three important points. And the first is the ability of, of the Obama administration to make the sale that this agreement increases American and its allies' security rather than decreasing it. That's point one. Two would be the ability of the Republicans, that is the Republican Party in the United States, to make the sale within Congress that they must block the agreement's ratification. And it's important to realize that this would be a part of their posturing and positioning uh, in respect of the 2016 general election, which uh, takes place next year, but is already overwhelming us in some ways. And the third is the nature of the engagement of the current Israeli government in the domestic discussion and debate within the United States and the way that has begun to play out. Now, we understand that the agreement comes to Congress, both houses, Senate and the House, on 17th of September or thereabouts. So it's, what, two weeks away, more or less. Presumably will be debated and discussed for a few days uh, or months. Um, and then the Obama administration is, on the face of it, unlikely, in, to say the least, to gain a, ma a majority in favor of the agreement given the fact that both the Republicans control both the House and the Senate now, it seems very unlikely that the Obama administration would be able to convince a majority of both houses to support it. But 
they're really hoping, that is the Obama administration, is hoping that in Congress, not in either house, will the Republicans gain a 60% majority opposed to the agreement? Because that's the real key. If the agreement passes by less than six, uh, is opposed by less than 60%, that is a, a motion is sent to the president not to go along with it, he will veto that, then the Congress will be unable to override that veto. And then therefore, because it is not a treaty, it will come into effect because it will have been an international agreement signed by the, by the president's uh, representative rather than a treaty between two nations per se. The betting now is that the Republicans will probably defeat approval, be unable to achieve 60%, then they will go through the ritual dance of the president vetoing it, and then the second round the Republicans being unable to overcome that veto, and then the agreement therefore comes into effect as far as the United States is concerned. Um, if you were to summarize the Obama administration's position in four points, and I'm extracting wildly from a variety of public, public statements, their first point of argument is that no agreement, no international agreement is 100% foolproof. But the inspection regimen is sufficiently strong that it can detect new buildups of uranium-235 before critical amounts have been separated from the 238, so as to lead to the creation of a sufficient amount of fissile material to produce a nuclear weapon. That second, the agreement creates a window of opportunity for a decade or more to encourage a broader social, political, economic cha change in Iran that changes, in turn, the nature of that society's ambitions and strategic concepts toward the world. That third, under the current circumstances, Iran was closer to reaching that critical threshold of fissile materials than it would be with the agreement. Absent the agreement, one rate of achievement with it, a very different kind of rate. And that finally, America's allies in the region are on balance because of all those factors, safer and more secure than without such an agreement. The Republican approach is to argue in turn, how many is this? One, two, three, four, five, six points. Six, doesn't, four, six versus four doesn't mean better, it just means more. Um, the Obama administration, they argue, is unable to negotiate hard enough to gain strategic advantage. There's a need for a tougher stance, a more, a more vigorous, rigid, uh, rigorous way of dealing with antagonists. That it turned, it gave away too much for possible chances to check Iranian advances. It sacrificed the needs of American allies, the the, the needs of American allies for their security with the false hope of Iranian compliance in the agreement, and that the International Atomic Energy Agency's inspection regimen is both incomplete and ineffectual. That is, and that, um, sorry, the last two points, I didn't number them, I had little stars. The Obama administration puts too much weight on the possibilities of reform in a government, that is Iran, that is already a sponsor of international state terrorism, and that finally, such an agreement fits into the overall Obama strategy of retreat, that a tougher agreement could have been achieved with more realistic people at the helm of such an agreement. That, in a nutshell, is the, is the Republican case made in various ways by various people. I think it's also fair to add that the uh, Republican opposition to the agreement is based on pinning all of these presumed deficits on the Obama administration and by inference on the likely Democratic candidate for president in 2016, forcing that candidate to defend an agreement as well. So it isn't, it isn't simply a debate Republicans versus the Obama administration. Republicans look forward to seeing this as a, as a club to be used in the campaign itself. And if you doubt that this is already happening, we're well into that election cycle. And so all these discussions uh, are taking place as we, as we talk. Um, now, 
I want to make I want to make a, a couple of very quick observations on the um, the country that's not in the discussion, but which is very clearly a part of it, and that's the Israeli government. Um, it is indeed true that the Israeli government, uh, especially in the circumstances of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, has made some uh, very deep, unusually deep forays into the U.S. domestic process, not the least of which was accepting a Republican invitation to speak to the Congress, absent the more normal diplomatic protocols. That's one, ver one obvious version. This isn't, after all, totally unique. Any number of foreign governments over the years have made similar kinds of efforts to influence public policy. What is different is that in this case, the engagement has been unusually partisan in that it lined up rather directly with the Republican Party <coughs> rather than speaking in terms of national interest and projecting a debate in the country as a whole, lining up, I think, unwisely with the Republicans on this. I think it's unwise in part because it creates for the Israelis the situation where support for their country is now in play in partisan political terms in the United States, and that's new. And that, I think, is something which was an unintended consequence, but very real. Now, I want to add one other explanation on this. Um, internationally, at least, you hear the argument fairly often, and I think it's, a, it's sort of a broad brush, bald kind of argument, that um, because a wide range of establishment American Jewish organizations like APAC uh, have come out strongly opposed to the agreement, uh, that this somehow signifies that the J American Jewish population has lined up opposed to it. There's, a lot, there's interesting survey data out, and it's, it's well worth looking into, that points to the fact that although establishment, quote unquote, American Jewish organizations have by and large been opposed to the agreement as it currently stands. If you look at the survey data of American Jews more broadly, if you look at the survey data, if you include people who are not simply members of APAC or the Anti-Defamation League or, what, or whatever it might be, but look at all such people, whether they are observant or secular, whether they are members of institutions or not, you find that, interestingly, the percentage of support for the agreement is higher than among the population as a whole. And this, again, I think points to a bad strategic vision on the part of some people to line up in a certain way. And I think uh, it speaks rather directly to the American political process. Sorry, where are we here? Um, okay. Uh, the opposition at the public level tends to line up opposed to it, drawing upon a popular historical memory of the hostage drama on the one hand and the generally acknowledged engagement of the Iranian government with uh, groups like Hezbollah on the other. Both of these points do not, in, do not help endear the government of Iran to the American population as a whole, which makes it a tougher sell for the Obama administration than, than it might otherwise have been. But I want to read just briefly. We have enough time to do this? A couple of paragraphs. Um, Brent Scowcroft, uh, who was the national security advisor both to, to two Republican presidents, Gerald Ford, and George Herm Herbert Walker Bush, George, George Bush number one, remember him? Um, he wrote an article the other day uh, in several newspapers in the United States, and I'll read just a couple of paragraphs from it because I thought it was enlightening about the way in which the discussion is going to be framed by people who are not Obama administration friends but who are friends of international agreements that make strategic sense. And I think there's a slight difference there. And he writes, Congress again faces a momentous decision regarding U.S. policy toward the Middle East. The forthcoming vote on the nuclear deal between the P5 plus one and Iran, known as the whole mouthful here, 
Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or JCPOA, and we're just going to say plan from now on, will show the world whether the United States has the will and sense of responsibility to help stabilize the Middle East, or whether it will contribute to further turmoil, including the possible spread of nuclear weapons. Strong words, perhaps, but clear language is helpful in today's cacophony. In my view, the plan meets the key objective shared by recent administrations of both 